Everyone, hello, welcome, welcome back. back. Another edition of that GD show that stands for Genevieve and Dave or nothing else. <laughs> it could be that goddamn show. I don't I'm know. Kidding. Depends on what mood you're in. Mm -hmm. And say hello to our guest tonight, Kara Quigley. Hey, Kara. Hello. You can, you can speak. <laughs> <laughs> Genevieve, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. I'm really excited to be here. It's been a crazy busy week. And so it feels like it's been a million years since we've done the show, but it has just been one week. Just one week. And it it also feels like we've been doing this forever. But I was thinking through it. We've only been doing it about four months. Yeah. So November, December, January. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't know. We keep coming up with these fantastic guests to have. And we've got another one tonight. Another heavy subject. We had a did you get a chance to watch last week's show? No, Kara? I didn't, but I did read through and uh, oh, I understand, man. yeah, a lot Ooh. of stuff. We, uh, we don't shy away from the tough topics, that, mm -mm. that's for sure. Um, so listen, it's a call-in show. We've got lines open um, and we want to hear from you if you have questions or comments about tonight's topic, questions for our guest, uh, questions for us, anything. We pretty much take any call, not every call, but... We've got, we we want to talk to you. So what is that number they can call, Genevieve? Uh, Y'all can call 217-375-9933. Y'all can call. That was so cute. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I just got back from Texas and I lived in North Carolina. So sometimes it comes out. It's a good word. Y'all can call. Yes, that's true. You can call. Every, you can call. And we'd love to have your questions, your comments. It's a, uh, it's a tough subject tonight. Um, school shootings. Um, gun violence, um, mass shootings, a lot of different directions we can go on this. But Kara's kind of an expert on this topic, and you'll find out why in a little bit. Um, but Kara, what's uh, anything you want to say hello? You know, what's on your mind? How are you doing? Um, well, we're between school shootings in terms of um, large mass numbers. I'm sure there have been a few that, you know, we don't know about because they're quite local. So I'm, I'm on an, um, a downtime, kind of. Uh, I tend to feel school shootings a little bit more than most, I would say. So I, I take a wave with it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I can, I can kind of go into hiding for a couple of days. Uh, mm -hmm. Michigan was really difficult. Michigan was hard. Boulder was super hard. That was a grocery store shooting. Um, I'm from Tucson, and the anniversary of Tucson just happened. I think it's January 8th. Um, mm -hmm. and I, and I also, I mean, like li li the liturgical year, there's the shooting year of America. So, you know, I know when, you know, Virginia tech and, uh, mm -hmm. Columbine and all those dates, um, April is school shooting month. So it doesn't surprise me that, um, that we're not seeing as much right now. I think we'll see more in April. April is also, um, the highest rate of suicide, um, for that month. And I do think that most, uh, school shooters and mass shooters are really attempting suicide and they just don't want to go alone. I think that mm. was the case for the Vegas shooter. Um, I think he just wanted to die in a, in a massively dramatic suicide. And while I have not read her book, I know that um, Sue Klebold, um, the mother of um, Dylan Klebold, uh, one of the Columbine shooters, talks extensively about discovering her son's suicidal tendencies and that he had basically hooked up with a homicidal person mm -hmm. and um but his goal was to end his own life. And so that, right. that was done at Columbine. So I think there's, I think, first of all, if any, if I'm going to share anything is the complexity and nuance and layering that we have to cope with and deal with in dealing with this situation. It is not simple. It's never been simple. And, you know, the first school shootings are around the 1840s. Um, so this is not 
new, there's not a new phenomenon. And people think that Columbine was the beginning. And I'm like, you know, really, it was the middle. It was mm -hmm. just some sort of watershed moment for us because the media, CNN, everything else, all the accoutrement that we have now. Yeah, because more more media attention. Plus, the weaponry has improved, if you will, uh, mm -hmm. so they can do more damage with uh in a shorter period of time there's there's those those kind of issues at play so also but, the scalia interpretation of the second amendment you see mm -hmm. the escalation of not only a proliferation of you know the the uh, automatic rifles that we see but right. the possession and ownership of them so once mm -hmm. you have scalia interpreting that any person can have any kind of gun they want then that that's kind of the consequence of what we're living in right now is that interpretation yeah and we're going to dig into some of the the nuances of that, some of the uh, nitty gritty of uh, what's going on in this country when it comes to gun violence, mass shootings, school shootings, um, and and Kara's going to kind of unpack a lot and of our, our complacency. In that. Is a, our complacency is a huge ingredient too. Oh God, yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Before we do, um, you can support the show by liking and subscribing. I'm not sure what that does, but I've heard it's, it helps. So go ahead and do that. And uh, you can support us on Patreon. Uh, the links to the Patreon channel, that's a good way to, to help us keep the lights on, so to speak. You can send the super chats, um, all the things that you know to do if you're um, a savvy uh, show watcher. Um, I'd be remiss to also not congratulate the uh, Kansas City Chiefs because that's where you're from, Kara. And I saw yeah. something on one of your <laughs> media things, and I was I was texting. It was an I don't know how many football fans we have, but God, what a game! It and was the a, last, that game. The last two minutes was just I was texting Daryl Ray. You know Daryl, uh -huh. and he's a uh, massive Chiefs Chiefs fan. He's his an blood NFL pressure, junkie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His, NFL his blood pressure was through the roof. He <laughs> <Sure>. said <laughs> yeah. it was. A crazy game. But anyway, um, that was fun. And that's yeah. a lighter. You know, I, I like the uh, light side of life. God, we need these diversions, don't we? Um, I know I do. Thank you, Tulin G in Mexico. Such a faithful watcher and supporter. Thank you for that. We appreciate it. I'm not sure how many pesos that is, but whatever it is, is great. And we thank you for that. Um so let's dive right in. We kind of already have because uh, I can see the passion in you, Kara. I love it. Um, why? Why are you so passionate about this? What does all of this? What does this subject mean to you? It's extremely personal. Um, OK, why so is that? In 1993, my father uh, revealed to me that um, he had planned a mass murder of his dorm in 1955 on the Swarthmore campus. And. Went in, this was, I think, January 17th, 1955, very cold winter, and he had um, been progressively getting more out of touch, becoming more mentally ill as um, this second semester began. He perceives himself to have been bullied in the dorm by mm -hmm. um, the guys there, and this bullying um, of my father began actually at four years old from elementary school all the way up. There was a brief respite um, at a prep school um, called the Hill School, which is in his small town in Pennsylvania. So he wasn't teased there. But after that, he went to Swarthmore and it started up again. And it was pretty vicious. I've spoken to many men in the dorm and they can confirm everything he says. But the, the difference really is in their interpretation of whether it was malicious or not. Um, mm -hmm. So that was interesting to have those conversations. Um, so as he progressively gets more um, agitated um, by his living situation, he was the dorm attendant. So he had the key to every single dorm and he was a dorm attendant because he was poor and he had to pay for his college. Um, and so he got, I think, free free room and board um, with that job. He was losing his scholarship. His grades were failing. And for my father, I can imagine that would be very difficult because he was such a genius and he was always 4.0. Um, he graduated magna cum laude from the Hill School. I think twice. I think he took an extra year just because he, I think, I think the family's kind of figured out the reason why he took that extra senior year was because he felt more comfortable at that school and was too afraid to actually venture out. Um, so as January rolls around, his grades are slipping, his girlfriend's angry at him, the boys aren't letting up. And at some point they take his mattress out of his dorm room and pee on it in the middle of the quad and set his garbage can on fire. And to my dad, order is extremely important. And this kind of just was too much. Um, and so 
um, he went to get his guns at his house in Pottstown. So he had to drive from uh, the town in, uh, where Swarthmore is all the way to Pottstown. And then he, I believe he would have borrowed a car to do that. Um, he brought home all of his guns, rifles and revolvers with a piece of coconut cake that uh, my grandmother gave him on his way out the door. And he said, I'm gonna sell all my guns. And so what's interesting about this that is really key to the story of a school shooter is that during this time, even though he's talking to his mother, even though he's gathering things up, and even though he's driving around on the freeway, he is clinically insane, absolutely and entirely insane. Even mm -hmm. though he can remember the insanity, he was not in his right mind. He did not know right from wrong. Uh, he, his plan was to kill everyone. And it was... I mean, you could say it was premeditated, but there was no plan involved. It was just, I'm going to show up and kill everybody, right? And so he walked into the dorm, and he didn't know who to kill first. And this became an issue for him. And so he walked up the stairwell, up another one, and up another one, and couldn't decide. And finally, he settles on a door, um, and on the door was a poster and it said the brains in the pawn and the occupant, one of the occupants of that room had said to him one day, you know, you see Bechtel, I'm the brains and you're the pawn. And that was it for him. That was the mm -hmm. door he was going to open. And so he opened the door, set down his guns and his flashlight and shot into the dark and hit someone. And he knew it because he knew the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and he knew he'd killed the person because of the sound because he'd hunted enough to know what that sound is. And he says that after that moment, a hand, he could feel a hand physically grab his heart and squeeze it really tight. And it jumped him. And he, he suddenly kind of came to. And he said that in that moment, he recognized he was far more loved than he had ever, ever realized. And that he knew instantly he had made a very bad mistake. And so I think out of panic or I just don't know. Um, I don't know enough about the mechanisms of sanity or insanity to know. But... Um, he took his guns and shot the rest of his ammunition uh, in that particular gun down the hallway. So for about 10 years, I was told that no one in the dorm had woken up. And when I started meeting guys from the dorm 10 years after I'd found out, like around 2003 or so, I learned that everyone was awake and they were terrified and they could hear the bullets coming through the hall and they could hear the bullets hitting the end of the hallway and they knew that if they got up and walked out, they would be hit. And so then I was dealing with a very small population, uh, you know, these boys who had basically had a lifetime of trauma because of this. And then I began to understand the larger scope. Mm -hmm. um, after my father had discharged uh, all the ammunition in his weapon, he went to um, his friend's other dorm, woke him up and said, I've killed someone and we need to go to the police. And then he walked down to the police station and turned himself in. In my opinion, having read uh, recently within the last year, read some of the court documents and my dad's um, representing himself and things, he was far more insane for a longer period of time than I used to think. Um, mm -hmm. Having to read some of these court cases, it was very difficult. My dad was unhinged um, and um, he really did deserve that life sentence. Absolutely. And so he was given a life sentence. He avoided the electric chair. Um, although that was considered. And then he was also recommended for a lobotomy, which um, my grandmother refused. And um, so they were kind of dealing with him like a mentally ill person. And what should we do with this person? Mm -hmm. So they sent him to Farview, um, Farview, Insti what is it? Farview Prison for the Criminally Insane or Farview Hospital for the Criminally Insane. And basically it's a prison for criminals who are mentally ill. And right. 1950s mental health care is not known as the shining decade. Um, about every other diagnosis at that time was schizophrenia. So my father was diagnosed schizophrenia, even though he exhibited no symptoms of schizophrenia, but nobody knew what had happened to him. Mm -hmm. So he spends four years and nine months in Farview State Hospital and experiences um, at least a daily attempted rape, for sure. Um, and then witnesses a ton of rape, uh, witnesses abuses, suicides, um, all sorts of horrific things um, that he documented in a, in a book that he wrote of his life. And then after four years and nine months, the, um, the chaplain and the warren, warden um, sought to see him released because they felt mm -hmm. that he had 
whatever had brought him in was not with him anymore and that he was no longer a threat to society, but they had to prove that. So they had another insanity commission and then his sentence was changed so that he was not incurably insane, but temporarily insane for the time of the murder and then somehow built himself back up um, and then ended up living a quite normal life, a beautiful life, um, prosperous and helped people all over the world, literally, um, and did what it took to uh, redeem himself. And I think, you know, he did. Um, that's not up to me to know or to, to judge, really. The murder never left him. It stayed with him the rest of his life. Even when his mind failed him, he remembered that moment. And, um, you know, at some point I had to recognize after Columbine, after Virginia Tech, after Nickel Mines was extremely difficult for me. Um, after everything in the last 20 years, I've had to rectify and recognize that I was the daughter of a school shooter. I was mm -hmm. raised with a traumatic, per tra traumatized person and that he could relate to the shooter more than he could relate to uh, the other victims. And that was hard for me to understand and, and grasp. Also more difficult was that my morality came from this person, mm -hmm. you know, and I hear grandchildren and children of Nazis talk like this, you know, that, that they learned good and evil from these people. They learned, you know, <laughs> they learned how to um, be shocked <laughs> by what their relatives did because of what, how their relatives gave them their moral compass. So that's been very strange and odd yeah. to kind of wash in. Um, yeah. So I know I you've talked about that in your talks and we'll get to that in a minute. Now, is your father still alive? No, he died in 2018. Okay. But you had a good relationship with him. Excellent relationship. Phenomenal mm -hmm. relationship. Nothing did, like you, unsaid. did you get flack from people who thought, Wow, he only served four years for killing someone. That doesn't seem right. Um, any thoughts on that? I mean, what kind of pushback have you experienced with that? Or did he experience, perhaps? I don't think he experienced it. Um, because remember, he was secret forever about it until we came out as a family oh, I see. in 2003. Yeah. <clears throat> it was secret from my mother's family. No one knew. Mm -hmm. Um you know, I mean, have you ever thought of that yourself? I, th thinking, I thought about it all the time. I thought about right. it, especially last year after I read the court, the court case and, and how he was behaving in court and his narcissism, basically, mm -hmm. um, just not recognizing the, the depth of his. I mean, I think he personally understood the depth of his crime, but he and once he understood that he was simply crazy, he, I think he kind of felt like he wanted to move on. And. Yeah, that's understandable. So he never he never um, contacted the family of the victim or anything like that or you. I have. And have I never you? told him I did. But yes, oh, I, really? did, I did my own restorative justice and I did mm -hmm. not tell him because I think it would have traumatized him. Yeah, um, that's understandable. But I needed to because so there was a documentary made um, about this in 2006. It was released at the Toronto Film Festival. And what oh, really? that ended up doing was causing a little bit more harm than it should have just because of the way in which the families were separated and things and whatever. And, you know, they found uh, the victim's family. And of course, they were very angry, which they have a right to be. <laughs> but they didn't understand the bullying. They didn't think that. They, and, and of course, then it implies that their brother was a bully, which he was not. And so that has to be made. And mm -hmm. that distinction has to be made. And, and then teaching people about the syndrome of bullying and what that does to a person's psyche um, and how they can't, they can't tell right from wrong very often. Um, and also I was able to explain the act itself, that it was a random act and that, that their son right. and their brother was not targeted in any way. Um, they did keep up with the story, at least until my father was released from, from prison and the son and the father never told the mother that he was released because it was too crushing. He destroyed an entire family. Mm -hmm. um, and, sure. you know, I, I, I feel that deeply. And, and so I don't know. I, I feel that um, I'm going to move around a little bit because my Mac's about to die. Um, but I, oh, I, no. feel, I feel that um, sometimes I feel like he didn't serve enough time. Let's just put it yeah. that way. And, and, and I, 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 I don't want to feel that because that's my dad. And I, I can tell that he did rehabilitate himself enough to live a normal life. But then, I don't know. The yeah. Kyle I mean, the, 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 Kyle the, Rittenhouse the week, the week of Kyle Rittenhouse was super difficult for me because oh, of, yes. because that, that was my dad. Mm -hmm. He was the white guy that was released. 
Yeah. And I mean, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to wrap your head around because retribution, justice, all these kinds of things come into play and you, you wonder, but the reality is nothing would have been served. He, he wouldn't have been served or anybody else wouldn't have benefited from him staying in prison longer. He was able to rehabilitate himself and become a, a good moral person. And, but that again, I can't speak to how the victim's family might feel about that because I've not been in that position. It's a very, very complex. Um, it's a very complex subject. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that we're, we do want to dig into that a little more as we go along. I want to say thank you to Tabitha Dante. It's a very generous gift. Uh, super chat of $50. Love the show. Love the topics. Dave, you're an inspiration. Thank you. Genevieve, you're sweet and adorable. Yes, she is. <laughs> I would love to see a show dedicated to discussing the effect that a religious upbringing, even a mild one, has on us as adults. We talk about that a lot. We, we, we'll dig into more of that, I'm sure, as a complete show. Thank you so much for that. And we will we will do these things. Um, Genevieve, initial thoughts. I know you've seen um, Kara's talk. We talked about that this afternoon. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, your perspective is so unique and something that I love in the talks that I've seen you do is that you remind everybody that oftentimes the family members of these shooters are are also victims and are also traumatized. It's so, so difficult um, for a mother or a father or a brother to understand that this person that they love unconditionally ruined somebody's life. Um, but I'm also so, so glad that you brought up restorative justice. Because I think that restorative justice is so necessary and so important, not just when we're talking about how society and mental health and the way we treat each other increases crime, but how our prison system just doesn't work. And I think it's so great, too, that you also recognize that your father was the white man that got away with this. And, and in, in, you know, in, especially in the 1950s. I don't even know if like a, a white woman would have been treated the same way. I mean, we were. Well, we, in... we could certainly say yeah. that a black man wouldn't Absolutely. have been. I mean, without question. Of course. And, and, you know, I mean, they serve longer they... prison sentences for possession of marijuana. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And they're arrested at such a high disproportionate rate, especially to the rate that crimes are actually committed. I, and something that people don't understand about, about white privilege is that it's not just, demonizing white people it's saying that hey everybody should have this privilege like everybody should be able to be treated the way that your father was where they recognize that he mm -hmm. was actually able to to join society mm -hmm. um it's it's such a complex topic and i can't even imagine how you feel holding these things true that you love your father and he was a good man but he also murdered somebody Mm -hmm. um, What's the story of America, isn't it? We yeah. love our country yeah. and yet we began with a genocide. I feel like my journey is very yeah. much representative of how America is going to have to learn how to cope with. Yeah. It. And I mean, we're starting to uncover things that we never wanted to deal with. I, I, I'm ashamed to admit that growing with the South, there are parts of our history I never learned as a mm -hmm. child and, mm -hmm. and are mm -hmm. just now learning as an adult. And it's, mm -hmm. it's unbelievable how whitewashed our, our history books have treated our American story. Or that but, uh, sometimes well, war medals were used to cover up atrocities and massacres. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, we'll talk about some of your, the, the studies you've done, the psychology in your talk, anatomy of a school shooting okay. and, and the bullying and things. I want to get this call though, because an underlying part of this topic is our fucking access to guns in this country. And we can't ignore how much of an element that plays. But And this is a call from Anton in Mexico and wants opinions on children using guns from an early age. He, him. Anton, are you there? Yes. Hello, Dave. Thank you for having me. Hey, Anton. Thanks for calling. What did you want to talk to Kara about tonight? Or me and Genevieve or all of us? All of us. <laughs> yeah. Well, all of you. Uh, well, you see, I, I love uh, guns. I, I okay. really, really love me some guns, right? Uh, I, I just like them a lot. And uh, it might sound weird, but at the same time, I am very, very anti-gun usage. 
So, uh, for example, I follow these uh, pages on Instagram with, about guns, about like firearms and stuff. And every once in a while, I get uh, videos about uh, children using guns. Mm -hmm. And it, it just, um, I don't know, it, it, it's unsettling to see that. And I get into arguments with, with people like uh, saying that they, they shouldn't be handling those kinds of tools. And uh, the, the counter argument I get is that they are, because it's, it's not like videos about them using them, you know, wildly. It's, it's, it's them being taught how to, how to respect the tool, how to use them properly, learning from an early age. And I, I cannot counter the, those arguments. So I, I was wondering if, if I'm just too biased and the teaching kids how to use guns properly is, is actually a good thing. What, what are your opinions about this? Yeah, your opening statement is, it does sound like quite the contradiction. Um, Kara, your thoughts on yeah. his... You're calling from Mexico? Yes. Okay. So I don't know much about, I mean, I grew up in Tucson, Arizona, so I know very little about Mexican culture. Let's put it that way. I grew up an hour away from the border, which means basically nothing. But I would just venture to say that in Mexico, is there, oh, let me ask you, in Mexico, do you think that there is a gun culture? No, in, in Mexico, uh, gun control is a lot, a lot more tight. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's not mm -hmm. like the U.S. So when I see these videos on Instagram, they're from, uh, from the U.S. And it just, uh, um, I, I don't know, it, 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 I find it very weird. I now, do too. Of course, I, I'm, not, I'm a foreigner, but I find it very weird how, how much freedom, how much... Uh, uh, access to guns the the u.s citizens have and i always argue that and uh well i get i get the uh, those arguments why well you can purchase something that can kill thousands of people but you can't drink so and that's that's interesting because an 18 year old can purchase a gun but they can't drink yet that's very odd then the reason why i bring up culture is that america has a gun culture it's a subculture and there are stratums within that oh right? yeah there are atheist gun nuts, right, that are really into guns, but they're also not necessarily into the patriotic end of it, right? But there are people that believe that guns in America are one and that fighting and that, that freedom is all a part of the gun culture. So freedom and the ability to kill people <laughs> really goes hand in hand in America. And our definition well, of freedom and there's that underlying thing come with killing people. Yeah, and there's the even a God-given right. I've heard that phrase. It's a God-given right. We have a right. God-given right to own guns. I don't remember seeing that in the Bible. No. In fact, I remember Jesus saying, he that lives by the sword will die by the sword. Mm -hmm. And that was his age's guns. Mm -hmm. And and I don't understand. And, and Carrie, you and I talked about this, and I want to touch on it. I, I see, you, yes, atheists mm -hmm. have guns, but primarily the predominant... Mm -hmm. Subculture in America is thank you, asexual atheist 499. Um, the predominant subculture, hand in hand, is conservative evangelicals and the love of guns. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I, I think we could talk for hours about the psychology behind that, yeah. but I don't think it's, I think it's undeniable. Right. And I, I don't want to let this other question of his go because it's about yes. children. Um, right. And so no, that's a good point. I think in America, because there is a gun culture coupled with no health care, coupled with people working too much, and there's absolutely no vacation, so nobody gets a rest ever, ever. Nobody gets that respite. Um, there's a lot of neglect of children, okay? And while I don't think that video games alone will do something to a child, I think when you pile video games and stupid binary plots, good versus evil on top of everything. You run it all the way back to the Bible with that framework of duality. Children will often then interpret that there is only two choices, right? So I either kill myself and die or get rid of everybody around me. And then that will solve my problem. That when we get to the mentality of a school shooter, that's their mentality. Mm -hmm. um, it's a problem solving mm -hmm. mechanism. It's a problem solving you're... mechanism and right. guns are problem solvers. <laughs> Again, so part and parcel of the gun culture in America, 
guns are protection and freedom. They are not weapons and they are they are not killers. Okay, guns do not kill people. Remember, that's what their that's what their whole thing is. A gun is protection and freedom and your God given right. Right. That all these this is the culture. Um, so it, guns are very different in America than they are anywhere else. They, and they're treated differently. They're called baby and take they have pictures on Instagram. Right. They're, they're treated like, you know, fashion. They're called baby. Look at oh, we had baby. we had several mm-hmm. politicians, several politicians who posed with their families for Christmas cards with mm-hmm. everyone holding these automatic weapons, not just a shotgun that they hunt with, but killing machines, yeah. automatic mm-hmm. weapons. They aren't fun. Assault yeah. weapons. Um, so yeah, the 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 question about teaching children <laughs> to use guns, yeah. as though it's, I, I guess your question, Anton, is, are we can we teach them to to be responsible with a dangerous tool and is it wise to do so? Well, my, Mm -hmm. uh, my, um, the the way I would usually, the way I usually put it is that, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, a a child doesn't have the the mental maturity to be handling those kinds of tools that are just, they're meant for killing. Mm-hmm. Uh, even no, if it's uh, absolutely safe. not. So right. Do you think this is my bias talking? My anti-gun bias talking. Yeah. No. I I don't think that's your anti-gun I think it's your bias rational brain. talking. Um Yeah. Absolutely. It's and it's interesting too because you know, I I understand what you mean uh when you say that you love guns because I know a lot of people that really love guns. I I lived in the Bible Belt. Um you know, my partner went to a Christian school where the principal was loaded with like three guns on him at one time, like a little one strapped to his boot and like another one on his hip. And I i mean, I grew up in San Francisco at hippy dippy private schools. Like I didn't I don't think I touched a gun until maybe I was like 21 or 22. Um, but I understand that there's a very different culture where there's guns everywhere. And I personally wish that that just wasn't the case. I just wish that, hey, maybe if nobody had guns, uh, we wouldn't be in this problem right now, not just with school shootings, but with all violent crime and with kids accidentally dying. But that third part is where I think that it's if you were going to, if you were going to be that person that has a firearm in your house and you have children, you absolutely need to either I mean, both keep it under lock and key, never loaded with never loaded. ammunition, locked up far away. Or you also need to teach your children that this is not a toy. I have friends who have lost family members who are three, four years old because they just they picked up a gun that wasn't stored. And they said, what was this? And they shot themselves. I've had friends who were in high school and and their girlfriend broke up with them and they had a shotgun right next to them so they could kill themselves and they did and children are not rational enough to to understand the gravity of what's in front of them and so if we can't keep them away then we need to at least teach children to not accidentally kill themselves but that still doesn't that still doesn't take away the danger of them getting bullied and traumatized and bringing it to school and it doesn't take away the danger of them killing themselves so so does everybody know about the experiment with boys and girls and guns does everybody remember that study Mm-mm. where they um educate us well okay so this is a really famous study you can look it up they they put boys and girls in a room with unloaded guns all over the place like right? hidden places or whatever when boys pick up a gun or anything shaped like a gun okay they automatically pull the trigger hmm. without fail. When girls oh, pick it up, yes. they just yeah, look I, it I over. They one. don't know what it is. And, huh. and they don't know to do that. So we're teaching our boys very early the mechanisms of weaponry, the justification for having them, and how to use oh, them. Oh, as a kid, I played I played war with my brothers. I played battle. You, you're shooting. And then the video games depict that. So, yeah, I, I, I think it is a, a very... Um, male female dynamic i i don't i didn't know there was a study given on that but yeah it makes sense that that that's exactly what would happen i mean mm-hmm. that's the you're right they're taught from an early age that this is a killing weapon it's a defense mechanism and you're powerful with this in your hand mm-hmm. you can do damage with this in your hand and i, I the, the whole concept of of 
the you know you hear this argument all the time and I, i'll just go on the record i hate guns i hate guns with a passion i think the world would be a better place without so many fucking guns and i grew up in the in the country and i grew up with guns i grew up hunting i could load a gun i could clean a gun i could take it apart i could go out and i shot squirrels and rabbits and quail with them i tried to shoot a deer never could but um, I learned to hunt at a young age, and I, I didn't have to get my parents to give me the gun. I knew where they were, and I l loaded them and went outside and shot them. But as I got older and I saw the problems we have in this country with guns, I just, over the years, have gotten more and more disgusted with our American love affair with guns. Mm -hmm. And then back to the subject at hand, after Sandy Hook, after what happened there and nothing changed, in America with our gun control and gun laws, nothing changed. Were you surprised? I realized I written no, well, I kind of was, Kara. I kind of thought this will move the needle. These little children being slaughtered will move the needle. And when I saw that it didn't, I got I gotta tell you, I gave up on our country in yeah, terms a lot of, of gun did. control. Mm -hmm. I That's thought common response. if if this doesn't change it nothing will we just have to admit we love guns more than we love children let's just admit it let's quit making excuses this is just the country we live in well freedom is an excuse to kill it is that's just what it is um and i think also in the evangelical am, am i wrong or go ahead is, uh, uh, according to me uh, i have the understanding that the u.s is number one like world champion on uh, gun uh, deaths. That's oh, to by, gun by, a, by a huge mm -hmm. margin. Absolutely. More than any of the next 10 countries combined. And, and something else to keep in mind, since Anton, I know you're calling from Mexico. You know, in, in Mexico, there's only one place in the entire country where you can legally buy a gun. It's in Mexico City, and it's a government department. That is the only gun store. So all of the violence, all of the guns yeah. that are killing people in Mexico are coming straight from America. Yeah, It is so lucrative. We are not just killing our children in this country. We are murdering everybody who dies by a gun in Mexico. And Afghanistan. It's yeah, and I've got yeah, also all over the world. We kind of have this like military industrial complex where we like to go and just shoot people all over the place. So, yeah, the NRA is a national is an international organization. Yeah. It's mm. it's maddening. It's it's frustrating and I uh, thank you Anton. We've got a couple more calls coming in, but um I appreciate your call and that's a very good question and my my opinion on that is don't teach your fucking kids to use guns, please. <laughs> Keep them away from them. But that's just me. I may be crazy. I would say if you have guns, teach your kids how to use them so they don't accidentally kill themselves. But also consider just not having guns. That would be yeah. a really great thing, too. Thank you, Anton. Appreciate your support, Thank you. brother. Thank yeah. you so Thanks, much. Anton. Bye bye. Thank you. This whole argument about guns are for protection. Um, I can't think of his name all of a sudden, this a comedian from Australia that I love so much. Um, it'll come to me, but he has a great bit on gun control. And he, and it's. Yes, I see uh, it. Jeff, uh, Jim, Jim Jeff, Jeffries? Uh, Jim Jeffries. Thank you. Yeah, but he, his, it's a brilliant takedown. Um, he's from Australia. And he said, we had a gun shooting, mass shooting in Australia. And the government said, okay, no more guns. And we kind of went, okay, yeah. good point. In America, we said, you're not going to take my guns. And well, he says. It, wait a second. Wait a second. We, I, don't, I don't mean to interrupt, but we have to be very careful because it is true that it's in our Constitution. Mm -hmm. Well, our Constitution was written when you had to, to uh, uh, no. pull, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't as, know, as it's no used now. No other country has to overcome writing, rewriting their Constitution in order to change the law. They don't right. have to do that. You're right. Yeah, you're right. And, I mean, well, it's, we've made it very com these, complex. But the Constitution for these evangelicals is the secular Bible. And one uh -huh. way they can embody the Constitution, live it, is to carry a gun. That Second Amendment is actually in their bones. They can live it. They can carry that gun around, and they're embodying it more than they could ever embody the Bible. Well, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I know that we've got a constitutional problem here, but it, it doesn't override the bigger problem. Of no. We've got too much, too many guns, too easy gun access, and those kind of things. The idea that it's for safety, if you keep it by your bed loaded then your kid's gonna get it and kill himself mm -hmm. 
More if than you likely. keep it by your bed or in a safe unloaded, then it's not going to help you when someone breaks into your house. No. Right. You're and, gonna have and, to tell them, right. "Hey, hang on a minute. Let me get my gun and get it loaded. Then I'll deal with you, motherfucker." Yeah, that's Male the that's the thing Jim Jeffrey shows. Strong. They're super yeah. strong. You know, I mean, I <clears throat> uh, one guy I dated a, many many years ago kept saying, like, "There's no mistaking the sound of two bullets going into that you know rifle, and then you click it." And I go, "Oh, so while you're getting robbed, or there's an yeah. attempted rape in the house." It's going to be so quiet. They're going to hear that. And they're going to be like, oh, I can't. I can't. I'm too afraid of the rifle. No. I mean, what are you, crazy? Right. It, it, he just kept saying that. No, you don't. You can't mistake that sound. They'll hear that. I'm like, no, no, really. You haven't been in the chaos of, of no. a home invasion, obviously. Right? You've only well, seen them on TV. I, so before we get, and we got a couple more callers here, and I want to get to them. Um, but your, your, your talk and your study is more so on mass shootings and not just gun control. And cause we could argue all night about more guns, less guns, better gun. I mean, I saw a comment in the, in the chat about we need more gun uh, uh, education, not less. Yes, but we need less guns. I mean, that's, but we could go all night on that. Kara, what is behind the psychology or the anatomy of a school shooting? What is causing I think your point is they come from middle class families. They're angry for, for the most part, angry white men. Uh, I'm generalizing, but break it down. Give us the snapshot of what's so causing mass shootings in this country. It's usually more affluent communities, but the shooters themselves are not necessarily affluent. Let me put it that okay. way. Okay. So you're you're not necessarily dealing dealing with just rich kids. My dad was extremely poor. Um, my dad also came from a single parent household, uh, when in the fifties, that just didn't happen. He was abandoned by his father, um, pretty vocally and, and physically abandoned. Um, but okay. So let me just, let me, let me paraphrase all, let me, let me go back a little bit. When we met Catherine Newman, who is a rampage shooting expert, um, I think she was at Princeton at the time. Um, Catherine Newman wrote the book called rampage. And at that time in 2003, there was no profile for a school shooter. They could not figure out across the board what the commonalities were. So what I came up with was this idea that it's a cocktail. It's mm -hmm. an, it's a, I wrote an article called Cocktail of Crisis. And it's these markers that we should be cluing into, but we aren't cluing into them enough. So more than likely, they have been bullied from yeah. a young age. So it's in their system. They're suffering from a syndrome. They're suffering from PTSD from the school. So going into the school every day is triggering them. Even if the incident happened in kindergarten, they're still going to have something left over. So what my dad really focused on in terms of trying to understand what had happened to him was to study the work of Dr. Olius in Norway, who studied the school social structure and school sort of playground environments. And what he found was like this strict, um, I'll call it a caste system, in which you cannot move up uh, unless you somehow ingratiate yourself to people and and my dad was a nerd and nerds can do that by helping the jock get a straight a on something right um but that's an impenetrable top circle that tends to rule over everything for popularity whatever mm -hmm. it is there's also theories in evolutionary psychology about the alpha and how when you have an alpha there has to be an underdog because then the alpha can't function if you read isabel wilkerson's book cast she has a, a good lengthy discussion about that that the that a dog pack has to have dogs that they nip on. I mean, it, it's just the way it works. So there's part of our brain work uh, that that's kind of wired that way a little bit. Mm -hmm. The teacher, so one of the more um, s sort of nefarious things about bullying is that nobody sees it. And that's right. just the, it's the nature of it. It's the nature of, ev it's invisible. So it's very difficult to prove and it's very shameful to admit for anybody, especially boys. So let's also get into the culture of hypermasculinity. That's another ingredient in everything. So more than likely, this bullying uh, had an LGBTQ quality to it um, because that's what they target after, you know, like, oh, you're mm -hmm. they call them pussies or they're, you mm -hmm. know, they're acting like girls or whatever, which is the, like, obviously a horrible thing that would happen to a boy. Mm -hmm. They demasculinize them. Um, so there's always a demasculinizing quality to the bullying. And so then in order to combat that, to remasculinize or hypermasculinize, they will go toward the myths. The 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 whipping boy will do that. Right. The, the potential shooter would do that. 
if they're not going to kill themselves, which many of them do, they're going to end up arming themselves. And so this syndrome, the, 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 the level at which this pattern starts is much earlier than the incident. It takes years. And if you look at the artwork of these boys, it's pretty clear that there was something going on in elementary school. My dad's mm -hmm. artwork was, should have been evaluated, you know? Yeah, it should have been caught. Yeah. So Nicholas mm -hmm. Cruz, this happened with, and then the poetry of Cho in Virginia Tech was also looked at. Like they kept trying to say this isn't right. Um, who was the other one? Um, I think the kid in Michigan had had painted or or drawn. A and you said too. this this syndrome is also it's not just because we've got more going on in this country than just school shootings. There are also shootings, like you said, uh, in Las Vegas, in theaters, yeah. in churches. Right. But the Orlando. but the profile is the same. Uh, well, okay, with these so guys, with you these and I guys. talked about this a little bit, right? So the syndrome, the bullying syndrome that is it happening to the boy um, who goes and gets the gun. So then his, once he gets to that point, he's going to try and kill everybody. It's, it's right. not, he's not going to just aim at the people. Very few of these shootings are specific and targeted. They are mostly random. They are there Very to random. kill right. everyone, okay? Because mm -hmm. that is the problem-solving thing to them. They are going to solve their problems. That's exactly what my dad said. Two things my dad said over and over again. Couldn't have done what I did without the guns. Guns are the problem. And number two, I thought I was solving my problems. He thought his mother would congratulate him and they would, he would run off with his girlfriend and get married. Hmm. So that's the level of insanity. Now, as you and I talked about, when we get to these other mass shootings, these people are older. They've accumulated more stressors. Again, no health care, no daycare, no nothing. So um, you're, you're getting into higher complexities and higher levels of stress. The men are more responsible for things. You possibly have things going on, um, like latent homosexuality. Again, if you mm -hmm. hide who you are, you end up kind of divulging that sometimes in violence. Um, you have, um, people who do not feel that they can control any aspect of their life because America is very traumatizing to live in without any help from the supporting structures at all. So just, just to pause right there. Medication and mismedication. Let's not forget that for the right. school shooters and mass shooters medication. Now we have to look at the last 25 years. It plays a huge role, especially yeah. if you're in that first 40 days of that medication. Just to pause right there. Um, I want to get to, I got cookies, super sticker question for Kara and thank you. Kyra. Well, yeah. Um, th right there. Do you see it, Kara? I want to, before you, before you answer that though, what does Kara think about parents being held responsible for their kids shooting up a school? Um, you mentioned something about, cause, cause the simple answer in my head before, cause, cause when you talk about bullying, the, the simple um, response to that is kids are bullied everywhere, not just in the U S kids are bullied all over the world, but mm -hmm. it's not just that other countries have less access to guns. It's the social structure in so many of those other countries. You talked about a couple of uh, uh, points on the social structure and the breakdown in America and these stressors, as you called it. I think that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. It's Huge. a very, very complex, complex, like you said, a cocktail that just breeds this. Um, it's, it's just a, a perfect storm for it, these right. shootings. If, if the culture does not develop a structure of an ethic of care, mm -hmm then how is a family ever going to learn that we're going to, they're going to have an ethic of care. Mm -hmm. um, people are too busy <laughs> on quite honestly. Yeah. You know, I mean, they, they see things. There, there were at least four people that saw the last four big shootings. They saw the shooter with the gun. They thought hey, he shouldn't really have that, but they have to go on about their day. Don't they? Mm -hmm. They have to get to that job as an essential. They've worker. got an appointment. Right. Mm -hmm. So what, what do you, how do you answer? I got cookies. Um, what is what do you think about a parent being held responsible for their parent, kids shooting up a school? I think every single parent that has a student that brings a weapon or shoots somebody on campus needs to be um, interviewed to the hilt. I think their house needs to be searched, quite honestly. And I think that you have to bear the responsibility that that minor ended up with a weapon that you probably bought. And you have to bear responsibility. I think in, in the case of minors, the parents need to be at least culpable. Um, now, in the Michigan shooting, there is so much evidence that they were so neglectful in every scope, mm -hmm. every single way. I have absolutely no problem with them being um, persecuted for this. I also don't think that that shooter in Michigan should be tried as an adult. He's not an adult. 
He's not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we have to respect that. As a nation, we have to see that our children are killing each other. And if we don't do that, if we don't see the truth of that and try him as an adult, we're doing it because of the heinousness of his crime, you know, rather than the fact that we have to look at the 16 year old boy who grew up in mm -hmm. our culture on our watch. Mm -hmm. With those parents. With those parents. <laughs> and those parents knew other parents and knew other people. This is my whole thing. We don't, we don't look at each other. When I open my talk, Anatomy of a School Shooting, the first thing I point out about what I learned about indigenous cultures is that when somebody transgresses in the tribe, the tribe sits around and says, what did we do wrong? Yeah. They don't say, what did point. you do wrong? Right. They own it. They, they, they say, bear the responsibility. They bear the responsibility of, of what their, their mm -hmm. culture produced here. Mm -hmm. And we are bearing no responsibility. And mm -hmm. our complacency and apathy is just allowing children to die. Hmm. Let's get to another call. Um, Tabitha, she, her, teaching kids how to use guns has discussion points on this topic. We're, we're doing kids and guns tonight. That's, oh, that's America. rough. Yes, <laughs> Tabitha, welcome to the show. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Thank you for your call. And I'm, what did you I, want to talk about kids I'm and guns? I'm very is... uh, happy to be able to, to, yeah, to talk to all of you. Um, when, um, I think was his, was his name, Anton? I forget. When he yes, spoke Anton about from Mexico. People, you know, wanting to teach, you know, children, you know, how to use guns responsibly. Pardon me, that's my dog coughing in the background. <laughs> oh, we got a dog doing that lately. Um, it, it, yeah, yeah, he's got a little issue. But um, it made me think immediately about um, similar um uh, point you know talking points i've heard people say about you know they want their younger kids before they're of legal drinking age well you know i'd rather have them you know drink in my presence and then i can mm -hmm. show them what responsible drinking is and it's just it just doesn't really work that way especially with something like alcohol i mm -hmm. know you know for a fact that there are many seasoned alcoholics that were pretty much hooked from the first drink they took Mm -hmm. And it didn't really matter how, you know, responsible they were, you know, their parents were with it. Some people have, they just have that gene or they have that tendency and you just never know, you know, even if you give them the best example, that you never really know where it's going to take them. Mm -hmm. And I just don't think that it's something that you can blanketly say, you know, I'm going to teach them how to be responsible with it because you just... You don't have control over what you do to them. And when Kara was speaking about it being the culture, it doesn't just stop at the, at the utility of the gun itself. I've seen, you know, videos of people posting, showing their kids about, you know, hunting. And, and these, these very young kids, eight, nine years old, mm -hmm. you know, a little girl whose eyes get as big as saucers now when she, when she thinks about blowing a deer's head off now. Yeah. It's just, it, it's very, very sociopathic. To me. And I just don't think guns. Yeah, they're just. And I don't think that this is something that's necessarily innate. I mean, you know, she sees her father getting all, you know, gung ho about it and how much fun it is. He really was just trying to turn his daughter into another one of him. It's not even so much, oh, I want to teach her, you know, the sport of hunting. Mm -hmm. You know, it, the culture is passed down and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a. It's a seems almost like a, a bonding type of an activity. Mm -hmm. it is. And I just heard way too many people say, I just love killing things. I just love shooting things. Mm -hmm. And it's just, it, it, they just don't see the, the big picture. And I just don't, I'm not convinced that it's something that you can just say, you know what, well, I'm, you know, it's important to show them how to use these things responsibly because you just never know right. where they're going to take it and where it's going to take them. That's all. Mm -hmm. Those are good points. Kara, your thoughts? Well, I just think also there's too many factors in America that can make your life a living hell. I mean, I, I just think that there's too yeah. many things in America that can go wrong by the time you hit 50 that, um, yeah. you know, it, again, like you said, there's too many factors at play here because, you know, people say, I'm a responsible gun owner. I'm like, okay, get a divorce, get diagnosed with cancer, lose your job, and then go bankrupt in six months. Tell me how you feel and tell me what your gun looks like after that. Because that's what happens. That's yeah. Well, and that's to, to Genevieve's point. Back, you know? Yeah, to Genevieve's point with her high school friend, uh, the easy access to a gun uh, was was the answer to his problem 
when his girlfriend broke up at age 16 and his life was snuffed out. It's safe to say, Genevieve, wouldn't you say that he, if that gun had not been there, mm -hmm. he would have gotten through that moment. Yeah, I would, I would say if that gun had not been there, but also, I mean, prior to this catalyst, I mean, I know that he had horrible low self-esteem. I know that he was depressed. I would talk to mm -hmm. him about this. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's both. It's just like, Kara, what you're saying is that mental health is not being prioritized. We don't have the health care to take care of it, but also mental health goes into um, housing security and wages and mm -hmm. access to health care, of course, food security. If, if there is no hope, if there is no support around you, of course, life is going to seem, seem pointless and, mm -hmm. and, and there is no good answer. But I do want to say to um, Tabitha, to your, to your point, um, I don't think that I would really necessarily in the situation compare um, teaching kids about guns to alcoholism, because I, you know, for example, I know ex Mormons who, as soon as they were not Mormon, and they could drink again, suddenly, they had never been exposed to it, they didn't know how to drink. And that's sort of where their alcoholism comes True. from. Right? That with, with, <laughs> with something like True. alcoholism, that is a disease, the only disease that I would put, like, um, that I would really put with, you know, you never know what's going to happen to your child is that, you know, something that we look at, when we're talking about sociopathy and psychopathy is that a, a child will, will want to mm -hmm. kill and torture animals. That is a very good inclination that there is something deeply mentally wrong. I think that most mental health, particularly with children, it does come from trauma and neglect and a lack of a support system. And so I think that, true. I, I think that we shouldn't have gun culture. I, I totally think that we should just not have guns. Um, but it's it's so frustrating and so maddening that it feels like in many places where gun culture is so prevalent, especially in white evangelical circles, if if you're going to do this, if you mm -hmm. if you are going to, you know, die on this hill of not giving up your guns, we better make sure that any child who who has Absolutely. easy access knows how to use it, but also doesn't have easy access in the first place that, and mm -hmm. that they have all the other support that we're not dealing with this. It's not perfect, but I think that when we're talking no, about something no. that is, that is harming us so much that there are so many kids dying, we need to be, we need to do everything we can, even if it's not perfect. We just, we need to do something because right now we're doing nothing. It, absolutely. I, I think my, my, my main point was that maybe there's, you know, until it's like a lot of other things, even, even, even religion for that matter. Like, you know, it seems like certain things we need to, to have a certain emotional maturity and, and wherewithal <laughs> before we can handle certain things. Mm -hmm. So my point was really more towards, mm -hmm. it, you just, you never know, you never know as you know, what, what the child has been through, you know, socially that you don't know about because bullying is, can be, a, you know, is a silent thing. It's just one of those things that where just my my um, gestalt towards it just seems to be that certain things you need a certain level of intellectual emotional maturity to you know to, um, to take part in and you know some things I don't I'm just wondering if it is possible that that they can be taught to be responsible with because you just never know with all these other factors how they how they combine and act on this one particular individual mm -hmm. those are my those are just my mm -hmm. thoughts well i think and there's that, no easy answer it's like like you're saying no that's, that's the that's the problem thing. um if you tuned in tonight hoping we'd have the answer to our gun problem in america sorry um mm -hmm. we don't um <laughs> But well, I mean, we can take a stab at it, right? I mean, I mean, this is what my whole point is. It's complex. I right. have a list of things that we could easily look at. I mean, you know, it, it's but it's it. The unfortunate thing about our population is it's uneducated. We mm -hmm. have a remarkably uneducated population. So nuance, layering, and complexity sure. are not a part of the general population. They don't know how to oh, think yeah. this way. No. And so by mm -hmm. trying to problem solve and trying to get it done. All they see is infringement on rights because for them, freedom is a free for all. It, it yes. just simply is that freedom is a free for all. And they cannot see that this philosophy, the philosophy they have of freedom is actually killing people. And they like, so in Switzerland, right? The, the people have proposed the idea that they have in Switzerland. And in Switzerland, your bullets are labeled. 
you cannot, you, when you purchase a bullet in Switzerland, it gets your name on it, basically. It mm -hmm. gets a, a serial number or whatever it is. Everything is tracked. Oh, wow. And wow. if they, they did that here, people would say, you're infringing on my rights to buy as much ammunition as I want. Well, do you really have a right to have as much ammunition people, as you want? want to, they don't even want to be required to carry <laughs> insurance. They no, and, that, right, because it's not seen as a weapon. It is simply seen as protection. Now, remember, mm -hmm. also, we have to get to the racist element of this because protection and right to kill is, comes from the racist notion. Once they freed the slaves, all the white people got paranoid. So mm -hmm. they're all going to get guns to protect themselves from these supposed black invaders that are coming to take their property. That is historically where that thought comes from. It mm -hmm. is the absolute racist origin of gun ownership in America. And actually, um, Bowling for Columbine has that in there. Oh, does this he? Is also, I didn't see that. A, yeah, there's a cartoon. It's a cartoon about the history of gun ownership in America. But this is actually academically studied as well. It's not just a mm -hmm. cartoon. I mean, th this is a true racist origin of that idea that you can protect your home, the castle laws, with your gun. Well, that's I want, I want to touch on that element, the evangelical connection because we're, we're talking about a Christian subculture subculture in this country. Thank you for your super chats. I don't, I just don't catch them all. If I miss calling your name, I saw Bill Castle. I saw Corey Springer. Thank you so much. You guys, uh, your support means a lot because it does cost money to have this um, call in studio and take your calls. And then um, if you can, there's Corey. Thank you, Corey. Um, if you can support on Patreon again, that's, that's very, th that's very, welcomed and appreciate it so much. Um, Kara, we talked offline a little bit about this, the, the connection, the connecting the dots between the conservative evangelical subculture of this country um, and their love of guns. Because yes, atheists do own guns, and, and but I think predominantly it's a conservative evangelical issue. Uh, they just love them some God and guns. And um, what I want to explore and we may not be able to unpack all of this if we look at biblical christianity it's a very violent religion in fact almost all religions are violent i guess except buddhism you know jesus would you classify the new testament would you classify the new testament as violent <laughs> i mean besides the whole killing of a child well, yeah, because our whole salvation is dependent upon the murder of the Son of God I, I, I get by that. his own father. Saying, I was no. just simply comparing the large wars of the Old <laughs> Testament. You know what I mean? Well, no, the Old Testament is just a bloodbath sure. uh, at the hand of God. Mm -hmm. A bloodbath. A fucking mm -hmm. bloodbath. Mm -hmm. And But it continues But the right the people new, lived. Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, the good people. Uh, God's, God's special people. Mm -hmm. It's funny how God's special people were where he took care of them all in the Old Testament until... You know, uh, Hitler wanted to kill them all. Then uh, where was God then? He was pretty silent and uninvolved at that oh, point. But, okay, yeah, if you're going to open but, a post Holocaust theology, I'm your girl. That's my favorite class. Uh, yeah, <laughs> no, I, I figured I would I would punch a button yeah. there. We better back off of that one. Um, yeah. But the I point is, over there. the point is that that the whole sacrificial lamb of God mm -hmm. is Sacrifice a very violent mm -hmm. story. So well, the Christian subculture is raised upon sacrifice. It's 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 a bloodthirsty God, mm -hmm. never satisfied with with blood. He needs more blood. He just needs more well, blood. And when you're yeah. in a relationship with a narcissist, you will give them whatever they want. And God is the narcissist. Yeah. You know, then you you've must got love the whole, me and worship me. So <laughs> you've got the whole apocalyptic. You've got the whole apocalyptic uh, mm -hmm. part of the story which says that this is all going to burn up anyway. Yeah. We're all going to go to heaven. Yeah. This shit doesn't really matter. And life is devalued when you look at it from that In frame fact, framework. Dave, I would even take it a step further because I, I think about how many Christians get on, on my content and get so angry and they just say, oh, I can't wait to stare down from heaven and watch you burn. It's sort of this, it's this vengeance. Yeah. This idea of of not just dualism and and good and evil, but this vengeance and well, this, this excitement that they can't wait to see the people who have wronged them be harmed. Their and, God demands vengeance. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. And which which is interesting because you know when I think of you know a school shooter who has been bullied and is traumatized, they it sometimes it feels like, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, Kara, but it, it seems like 
the answer to their problem and and the thing that makes it feel better is i can't wait to see all of you suffer the way that i have suffered exactly I, yeah is that what you're seeing Kara? exactly they, they yeah. ha it is the only method with which they understand they can get the attention they need because mm -hmm. so we talked about devaluation of life right um so i just want to make clear here and I, I always I always say this with the caveat, you know, I'm not sticking up for school shooters. This is not my point. My point is school shooters come from our society. Yeah, we that's a great point. Prevent yeah. them from happening. Right. Um, and I mean, I have compassion for them as human beings, but I, should they pay for their crimes? Yes. Um, I, I think. What were you saying, Genevieve, about your point? You just said it just it's, a second it, ago. It, it all sort of tying back to evangelical Christianity and the interpretation of revelations is that it sort of creates okay. this culture of vengeance. So, okay. So valuation of suffer. valuation of life. The reason why the whipping boy is going to seek revenge in such a violent way is that their life has been devalued. Their existence has been devalued. And so it is their only means to have a voice. Okay. Mm -hmm. To say, I, I am valuable. You ignored me. I am a, I'm a person. It's about personhood because when you are bullied, your personhood is destroyed completely. You do mm -hmm. not matter. Mm -hmm. And in fact, you'll keep not mattering. It's not like you don't matter and then they leave you alone. And also pernicious, you know, the nature of bullying is pernicious. It, you'll, you can be followed from elementary to junior high to high school, even up to college and into the corporate world and be bullied. I mean, this mm -hmm. happens. So I think it is about life that they're killing people. Honestly, mm -hmm. I think that they're trying to say, stop devaluing me. I matter. Well, but you don't. And God tells you, you don't. You're a worthless sinner deserving of hell. If you've grown up in the evangelical subculture, and I'm going to rant about this again. Thank you, Super Sticker Stanton, nine ninety nine. Wait, let me um, clarify. So you're saying this is the. So let me just get this straight. You're saying from the perception of the shooter, they would absorb this philosophy. Yes. Okay. You're taught from a young age that you are born dirty. Mm -hmm. You're born broken. Mm -hmm. I'm saying if they came from that framework. Now, not all of them, all of them do. I don't want to paint with a broad brush here, but I'm talking about the evangelical subculture this country lives in. It's the, it's the river, it's the current that runs under the country, if you will. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a river that runs under it. And not, not all of them, I, I know it doesn't apply to everyone. But I'm talking about generalities here. If you're raised with the- Subconscious too is what you're talking about. What's Absor that? Absorbing the subconscious. You're not Absolutely. saying that every school shooter is an evangelical. You're saying that they're absorbing no, the subconscious. No, it's that idea. In, yeah, uh, what's the culture? most loved hymn in America? Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. You are taught- from an early age that you are a wretch. Well, and you're, an you're a worthless, too. you're a worthless human being and only deserving of hellfire, except that God loved you so much. He murdered his own son so that somehow that would magically uh, give you an entrance to heaven. It's, it's a horrible message from beginning to end. Absolutely. And, and, and if, it's a sociopathic if these kids, message. it's sociopathic. And so if there's these other complicating issues, which you've identified so well, you factor that into it in this apocalyptic thing that where I, I, I'm going to go to heaven anyway. It, this life doesn't matter. It's the only life. It's only the life that's after this one that matters. All of that is just a, a lethal cocktail right. and for if this we kind use, of thing. If we use um, the book of Revelation for uh, sort of a skeletal structure of all the movies, right? They're all capitalizing right. on the apocalypse apocalyptic vision absolutely the end of the world all of, and i can't stand any of those movies and there's like nine of them coming out this summer and i'm so exhausted with these battles you know for the earth yeah and it's like does everybody i always love i i would love to do a whole lecture on how many drugs were taken before somebody took pen to paper because when john wrote revelation in patmos he was you know either fasting or high as a kite it was an acid trip it was an acid trip the guy is completely out of his mind like then they're and they're they can't wait for the rapture you know this is somebody yeah. else's acid trip dude mm -hmm. so anyway yeah it that's all weird but but again the idea of apocalypse the idea of rapture the idea of the end i absolutely believe that feeds into a shooting itself any shooting. absolutely i absolutely. believe that 100 percent is one of those rivers in a person's mind because of our culture. No doubt in my mind. Mm -hmm. The Bible absolutely influences all crime. <laughs> well, I, mean, I think the world would be a better place without religion and a better place without guns. 
But David from California, he, him, believes that the gun argument is more complicated than guns are good or bad. Okay. I guess. Sure. I think yeah. that's true. David, thank you for waiting. Hey, You're on. Guys. Hey, thanks for letting me join. What do you have to say? Yeah, so I, you know, I want to push back on a couple things and, and maybe I want to offer, I don't want to say a, a negative argument, but a neutral argument. And, you know, Dave, I think you said that it's, you know, evangelical, evangelical Christians who primarily are involved with guns. And I think it was Kara that kind of mentioned that, you know, everybody buying guns was kind of a, a, a racist movement. And I want, I want to push back against that because the founding of the United States was, was really about us warring with, with uh, England. And so it was really about people being able to own guns to push back against a government that might oppress them. And, and, and I would even argue that today that that's that same value that people, even, even if it's, you know, you could say, yeah, you can't own a tank, you can't own a bazooka, the government's going to destroy you. That's an invalid argument. It is still an argument that people use. And, and to Dave, um, it's not just evangelicals. It's people in rural areas who hunt. And, and you could say, hey, we can abolish hunting. Hunting's not good. It's not good to kill animals. And I'll tell you that hunters are, are one of the reasons that private lands still um, prosper old growth forests, mm -hmm. still prosper mm -hmm. animals that live in those forests. That in public lands owned by federal governments and state governments, hunters are protecting mm -hmm. lands that you can yeah. still see deer, even if they're mm -hmm. killing those deer, their tag fees uh, and et cetera, control that mm -hmm. lands. And without their tag fees controlling that lands, paper companies would buy up those lands mm -hmm. and so, destroy old growth hey, forests. So there so, is, bef so, yeah, before. So uh, what, what I want to get to, what I want to get ahead. to about the nuance is for me, for me, it's, it's a risk aversion thing. And I grew up in California. I grew up in Los Angeles. Half my family is from Alabama. I don't think you can simply say, let's ban guns in the United States. A, we border countries where guns can be smuggled into. B, well, there are hunters, which is, I think, to me, valuable. I think there's a value to being able to hunt meat. And if you eat any type of meat, whether it's commercially farmed meat, you don't really have an argument against hunters, in my opinion. And finally, see, I don't personally own a gun. And for me, because I know the statistics of owning a gun, you're more likely to have a family member kill themselves or shoot mm -hmm. someone else because of that gun. But if I lived in Compton, I'd own a gun. If I lived in Alaska and I was, you know, going into the forest and I was fishing, and I had to protect myself from a bear attacking me, I would own a gun. Mm -hmm. And I would say that you cannot have a solution to just banning guns in America like Australia unless you come up with a better solution, which to me is finding a weapon that is, can knock someone out, but is not lethal. Well, and it's, it's I, 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 as a okay, gun, it's, pause, pause one second, because we're going to run out of time, there. and I want to... I want Genevieve to have a response and Kara, but first of all, Tabitha, I'm sorry. I didn't uh, say goodbye. You got muted. I don't do this phone thing very well. Um, secondly, I, I think, I, yeah, when I say I'd rather not have guns, I think that's just an overarching statement that I know is not realistic in this world we're living in. Um, I, I think we could start with the fucking assault weapons. Maybe. Um, could we get rid of those? Cause you don't need those for hunting. And, but the other question, and I'll let Genevieve and, and Kara talk, when you say that we, we have to have them, I'm just wondering how these other countries survive without so many guns, because mm -hmm. they seem to do okay. Yeah, but go know, ahead. And, but, so, you know, just, you know, uh, so, so let me respond to that really quick before Kennedy and Kara. Mm -hmm. You're right. And, and honestly, I'm a, I'm a Californian. I'm liberal, you know, left-wing. Uh, I don't own guns myself. I've just thought about this issue a lot. And mm -hmm. if Good. you don't have an ability for a female, for example, to protect herself while she's out jogging, um, what you're all and you ban guns, ultimately what you're going to get is people who are doing home invasions, three and four of them, 
and there's not someone else who can equalize that situation. But but that's right not now, happening in these other countries. Shotgun, what? That's not happening in these other countries where gun access is not so ready. I mean, and more than likely, the, the female jogger is going to get that gun taken away from her and used on her. Mm -hmm. That's just as likely to happen. You I know, know that's that. Valid, Dave. Hmm? That's valid, Dave. And, and I mean, mm -hmm. that is A, due to our gun culture, right? But B, due to the amount of crime. For okay, example, let's let Genevieve uh, and, the, and Kara the talk a minute. Of, we're, we, we're, we're, we're talking too much, David. Talking. These. Yeah. These Davids ah. are talking too much. Genevieve, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Dave and David. Um, I mean, just first, <laughs> I, you've covered a lot here, but I do just want to, yeah. I guess, so going back to the beginning, um, the Second Amendment was never intended to really deal with an individual specific right to own guns. The founders loved militias and they wanted to have a militia so that you wouldn't need a standing army all the time. That wasn't about individuals having guns. And it's not the same. It's not the same interpretation that we have today it does not have the same influence on our culture and as dave said we have very different weapons today that the founding fathers would never have dreamed of i think you're totally right though about right. what you say about hunters i personally i'm vegan but i absolutely understand how much uh positive influence hunters have when it comes to conservation efforts um even though i have my own ethical problems with with you know exploiting animals of any kind. Um, I also I also understand sure. that, you know, my environmental science teacher was an avid hunter and I understand how how hunters really help with the overpopulation of deer because we've encroached on on natural land. But that's beside the point. Um, I think that you're you're bringing up some very valid points, but at the same time, oh, what you bring up valid points, except for the one point that you made about there would be guns coming into this country. Like I said, in Mexico, there is only one place you can buy weapons, and it's from the government, and it's in Mex Mexico City. They are getting all of our guns. If we actually restricted guns in America, that would have so, so much of a positive influence on Mexico and their crime rate, because they would have to deal with the guns that they have, not the ones. There wouldn't be new ones coming in. And in Canada, as far as I know, um, yeah, we got a lot of Canadians I, invading us. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think that Canada. Um, they're yeah, so no, nice. No, no, I'm not arguing for a minute. I'm not arguing for a minute. They're but they're no, so that's, nice. That's they would valid. just say, "I'm sorry" like before that. they yeah, shot you. Yeah, yeah. We like honestly, it's amazing how if we actually did something about gun control in America, what a positive influence that would have on our neighboring countries. Right. And on our society. Kara, Kara, your thoughts real quick here. Okay. So, first of all, David, thank right, you yeah. for being thorough. I really yeah, appreciate that was a you very being good, thorough. Yeah. And I love all the ideas and all the justifications you have for that. Um, I think we'll save my opinions for the origin of our country for later. Yeah. Um, the country was started because of taxes. <laughs> so they could turn around and do their own tax. It's all taxes. It's all taxes. That's why they had slaves. So they could avoid, spe it's all money. It's all money. Mm -hmm. um, but if you want to academically look at the, the psychology behind gun ownership during the pioneer, well, the pre-pioneer, it was post-revolutionary war, uh, post-civil war. You can look that up. I mean, it, it is, there are racial elements to personal gun ownership proliferating, okay? Mm -hmm. Not initially, obviously. And I understand during the Revolutionary War, people want to protect yeah. themselves. I do not have a problem with hunting within reason. I don't think anybody should be fishing the oceans at all. I think that oceans need to rebound yeah. but i do understand um <laughs> i do understand the um the psychological embedded need to teach your children to hunt it is there it's in our primate brain it's a part of our evolution it's there okay i don't think you need to have a machine gun to do that or a revolver i also don't think that um you don't have to um overly hunt or tro I'm against trophy hunting for sure, but I mean, hunting in terms that, let me, let me make that clear. Hunting for meat, I am for, not trophy hunting. Um, uh, but I think right. that, I think families can hunt together. My point is then put the gun in a safe place outside of the home at a place where hunters put their guns. Cause that's what other countries mm -hmm. do. They have yeah. to turn in their gun. They cannot take it home with them if they want to hunt. And I think that's right. reasonable. Right. Nobody's mm -hmm. taking your gun away. Why would you need your hunting rifle in your home? Yeah. You know? Um, but for me, I think what's really terrifying, well, let me get one more point. 
people in situations of PTSD, trauma, people raised in neighborhoods, like you talk of Compton, I know plenty of gang members that were raised in really bad parts of um, cities that do not feel safe without their gun. That's another factor we have to think about. There are people in which protection is paramount to their survival. Mm -hmm. And that's just the life they live. It's the brain they right. have. It's the trauma they've experienced. It's the world we're I'm, living in. Right. right. And I'm willing to talk to people about that. Mm -hmm. Where I have issue with that is the constant hypothetical. If you are that paranoid that your home is going to be invaded, if you are that paranoid that you're going to be raped jogging, then we've got a problem with our culture. We do not yeah. have a problem with gun ownership in certain terms of too much, you know, having guns in the home. We have a problem with a paranoid culture that feels it's being attacked at any time, even though we're the richest nation in the world. That is a problem. It's the mm -hmm. same. It's the same psychological dynamic of the white evangelicals feeling like they're being attacked all the time. The war on Christmas, like there is no war on Christmas. There is, there, the rights aren't being taken away. The voter fraud isn't coming, you know. From Kara, Austin. Kara, Kara, we couldn't even say Merry Christmas for Donald Trump. Sure. So, Come on. Uh, yeah. So what I'm saying is, is that there is a psychological problem with our paranoia. Okay. We have, what is it? Persecution syndrome. We yeah. have a really bad case of that. And so we have to, as human beings, calm the F down. You mean calm the to, fuck down? Yeah, calm the fuck down. <laughs> like, you have to, everybody needs to understand, and you know this, David, statistically, as soon as you buy a gun, you have put your life in danger. You have not actually protected yourself. Mm -hmm. nope. And if you're going to buy that gun because you think yeah, it's yeah. fun and it's I your do. baby and you're going to take it for a spin, as they say, when they take the pictures of those guns, then you need to leave it in a locker outside of your home. So mm -hmm. I, I think we're, America and paranoia, no, I, know that. I know. it's just, it, it's, Mm -hmm. Guns and paranoia <laughs> are a major psychological marriage. Mm -hmm. no, I mean, Especially, and not, not to interrupt. I mean, and, and like I said, I'm so sorry, David, but I no, also, I, while I you bring up. That. You know, I said that. Yeah. While, Kara, yeah. you bring up paranoia and guns, look at our problem with police shootings. It all comes down to them being paranoid that, oh, somebody's reaching for their phone, but it could be a gun. It's it's absolutely insane how how when you are in a heightened state of paranoia, you are going to act rashly and you are going to kill people that should not be killed. I think I can think of very few situations in which anybody should just be killed. It's it's unbelievable. And it's, mm -hmm. it's so it's well, so maddening. But also remember that um, over the last 10 years, especially the guy who wrote on killing who initially was the darling of the PTSD world because he exposed like what happens to men's brains when they go to war mm -hmm. actually ended up becoming the person that trained all those cops to be ultra paranoid. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that ran around with all those um, sessions yeah. and workshops that the, the fraternal order of police paid for, for these cops to go to and learn that mm -hmm. type of ethic, which was never hesitate. It's always a gun. Don't put your life yes. in danger. Always shoot first. And that was his training and it went all over the nation. Mm -hmm. hmm. You're so absolutely right. You have an entire right. generation of cops, okay? An entire generation of cops reaching a critical mass in these police, um, um, what are they, stations? Uh, that, um, precincts, that basically um, have, have created that culture inside mm -hmm. the police. And it's going to do a lot. It has going to take a lot to undo that. Because, again, it's very difficult once you've been paranoid yeah. to come and down I, from that. And I forget I yeah. forget the name of the gentleman you're talking about. But I, I got another book in my but, bathroom. I can go get it. <laughs> yes, but but exactly in his book he talks about how there are there are sheep and there are wolves, and you approach everybody as if they are a wolf in sheep's clothing. Mm -hmm. and See what we need is is yeah. officers yeah. like Matt Dillon. Remember in Gunsmoke? He always just shot the gun out of their hand. <laughs> Why can't we just do that? No, I, you know, you know, I preface that. I preface that. I said that, um, you know, the solution isn't banning guns. It's, it's finding no. a solution and coming up with a weapon that is as as quick and able to um, knock out someone without having to kill them. And yeah. I think but, even criminals would use this, right? If sure, you, but if then you, you still have the second amendment. If you have the ability to hold up someone, mm -hmm. what? Well, how do you overcome the second amendment? No, no, no. I, I, I'm just saying... I'm, I'm saying that there's got to be a solution, whether that's like a, a, a sonic boom that hits their ears and they can't, you know, they can't operate anymore. I think there's many countries that use less uh, lethal weapons. Yeah. They don't Every amendment can be amended. Yeah. It's an amendment for that reason. But David, you, you made some good points. We're going to run out of time in a couple of minutes, but thank you for the call. 
Um, you're right. It's a very nuanced situation. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank yeah you. thanks for the call, David. Very good. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I know we can't just say no more guns. I mean, I, I know that's a naive, courageous. Thank you for your comment. Yes, it as Kara mentioned, Second Amendment was about racism. It has nothing to do with militia. I think that's another point that we overlook or we don't know. I don't know. But um, we are going to have to shut it down in a minute. Um, Kara, final words. Sum this up for us. Watch your children. Teach your children well. Watch your children. Yeah. Be, be vigilant. You see somebody with a gun in their backyard that you don't think is mentally stable, report them, call them. Call 911. We have to stop giving everything the benefit of the doubt. And we have to assume. Is it safe to say that you that every parent should, I mean, not assume that that could, could bleed over into paranoia, but don't assume that your kid couldn't be that? Couldn't be a school shooter. Don't assume that he's okay. Is that what you mean by watch your kids? Well, you should never assume any child is just okay or any human being. We should all be right. there for each other, right? Um, but I think if you're dealing with a demographic of the loner or the nerd yeah. or the bullied um, or the depressed or the suicidal, I mean, but no parent wants to think their kid is that. Well, no parent is educated enough to know either. Yeah. So you know, again, there it goes go. back to that ethic of of mental mental health care. You know. One of the things my friend said, which I found fascinating when her husband committed suicide, was she said, I didn't know what depression looked like. Mm. Yeah. You know, and, and so it's, it, you have to be vigilant, right? You have right. to, you have to, it has to matter. And also I don't, I, this is my, you know, I'm a pure feminist here, but um, something <laughs> happened when women went back to the workplace, right? Or when women went into the workplace, right? The second, the second wave of feminism, right? Came and then we all got jobs and became men in suits and went and got male jobs. And so then we thought this was great progress, but we didn't ask for daycare and we didn't ask for healthcare. We didn't ask for right. anything that would help us, right? So now we're all eating fast food because nobody has time to cook. And I'm not saying that's a woman's job. I'm just saying that's what happened. We end up with both parents out of the house, both incomes being important, all the things we have to buy. And the children are literally they're not, there's no regard. And we're going to get into my multiple choice thing too. It's all about testing. That's the only way they get through school is through testing, not being a human being. As soon as I became a freshman, the last four digits of my social security number became my name. I did not have a name in high school because the objectivity of grading was important. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. You have a whole section of your talks on, on the educational system that we didn't even get a chance to touch on. It's okay. Multiple choice testing will make you a, a, a singular minded thinker. Um, it, yeah. You're just going to be looking for one answer the whole time and it will destroy your brain. It will destroy mm -hmm. your brain literally because you, you get so singular, which also is an offshoot of monotheistic philosophy. You'll always mm -hmm. look for that one place to go to because it all has to go back to one, which it doesn't. Gosh, so many layers of this. Um, Yes, yeah, so, so much to unpack. Um, I'm, I'm not shocked that we couldn't do it in an hour and a half. <laughs> yeah, just pay attention to your kids and don't bring guns mm -hmm. into the house, period. I mean, yeah. and don't bring unloaded guns either because my friend was shot in junior high because his cousin had ammunition and he had the gun and they loaded the wrong bullet into the chamber and the mm -hmm. bullet ricocheted. And so even though he was standing off to the side, he got shot in the head. Jesus. Mm -hmm. Right. So, I mean, and, and you know what? Every single person listening has a story about how somebody who got shot in high school, you know? So mm -hmm. it's not like it's, it's everyone knows. And that's the thing. Everyone knows. And everyone knows somebody who's been shot. And we do yeah. not care. It's, is, uh, that's, that's my summary. Uh, I mean, we, j we care more about our perceived freedoms and rights than we do about the human being next to us. Mm -hmm. And we and don't even know what the right definition of freedom is. It, is we, we don't. don't We've got this mm -hmm. idea that we have these God-given rights and nobody can tell me what to do by God because I'm going to carry a gun if I want to. And that's how they talk, by the way, every one of them. That's not um, just destiny. Yeah. And it's a, it's a we, just, we don't destiny. value this life that we have. And we mm -hmm. touched on a lot of reasons for that. And it's, um, it's sad. It's a tough subject to talk about. We... As you know, we took we tackle the tough sub subjects here. That's all I'm um, about. <laughs> Kara, you have been a wonderful guest. And, Thank you. Um, Post Holocaust will... theology next time. I'm totally into it. What's that? Post Holocaust Jewish theology. Oh God, yes. I'm totally in. I don't know. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but it sounds wonderful. <laughs> it's good stuff. <laughs> and um, 
folks, we do have a sharp cutoff time. We have to go. Yes. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Kara's bio is in the show notes. Genevieve, wonderful as always. Thank you as to the always. callers. Thank you to the super chats and the chatters and all you guys who support this show. We appreciate you. We love you. We'll see you next week. Uh, that's you. our show for tonight. Thanks. Thank you.